All right, well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Coffee with the Curator for the month of May. My name is Charlie Knight. I am the Curator of Military History at the North Carolina Museum of History. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about one of my favorite uh, North Carolina uh, people from the World War I era. And I will be perfectly frank, when I first came to North Carolina a little bit more than four years ago, if you had asked me who Madeline Hancock was, I would have had absolutely no idea. Uh, and it has been a fascinating uh, journey to learn more about uh, Madeline uh, Glory, as she was known. She was an extremely colorful character. And uh, to me, it's a shame that uh, not more is, uh, is known about her. Um, when I was uh, on the uh, lecture circuit back during the uh, World War I centennial a couple, of, a couple of years ago, I was giving a presentation down in, uh, I think it was Southern Pines. And the uh, folks who had invited me had just asked me to talk about some aspect of North Carolina and World War I. They didn't care what it was. It's going to be a, a very short thing, shorter than our, our talk today. And so they didn't know what I was talking about uh, until I got there. And when, uh, when I got down there, one of the uh, organizers asked me, okay, well, what are you going to talk about? And I said, well, I've got a great story for y'all. It's about the, uh, the very first North Carolinian to volunteer for service in World War I. They're like, oh, great. What's his name? He's like, aha, I got you. It was not a man. Uh, most folks would uh, would automatically jump to that assumption, thinking that we're talking about the, the first person to respond to uh, the War Department's call to enlist. But uh, no, it was actually uh, a woman, Madeline Hancock, and we'll uh, we'll learn more about that here in the next next few minutes. If I can get my slide to advance, that is. Here we go. Okay, move this box out of the way so I can actually see my slide. Okay. Madeline Hancock. Uh, she's actually not a native born North Carolinian. She's born in Pensacola, Florida, but there's an asterisk beside that. That is because her father was a naval officer. Uh, Samuel Westray Battle, you see a photograph of him there on the, uh, on the left of this slide. Uh, Dr. Battle, he's a, uh, a surgeon with the uh, US Navy, and he comes from a very prominent Eastern North Carolina family. The Battle family was very prominent around the Rocky Mount era, uh, area. In fact, uh, Rocky Mount Mills was, uh, was owned by the Battle family, so that's, uh, that's his kin. And uh, he, he's a naval officer, he's a surgeon uh, for uh, quite a few years. He's based at Pensacola there in 1881 when his wife gives birth to their only daughter, Madeline Hancock. And uh, she spends a few years down there in Pensacola as, uh, as an infant and a toddler. I'm sure she didn't remember anything about Florida. Uh, which is probably a good thing, but uh, I digress. But um, Dr. Battle, he's forced to leave the Navy through no fault of his own. As a Navy surgeon, he was, uh, he bounced back and forth between uh, land stations as well as serving on board ship. And it's uh, on one of these uh, tours when he's on board ship, uh, he's involved in an accident. I believe the, the ship collided with something or ran aground or, or something. I don't remember the details of it, but anyway, he was injured. Uh, his hand was very severely injured and uh, not, not very good injury for a surgeon. And because of that, he was no longer able to operate. So he, he retired or he left the Navy and he went into private practice. Uh, he was still, his mind was still fine. His other hand was still fine. He just, uh, his, uh, his dominant hand was uh, so injured uh, that he could no longer do surgery, but he was still perfectly fine to, to practice quite a bit of medicine. So he comes back home to North Carolina and uh, he will uh, wind up moving to Asheville out in the mountains. And it's been said that uh, Dr. Samuel Westray Battle is really the reason that Asheville is, becomes on the map, uh, becomes on the radar of a lot of folks, including uh, the Vanderbilts. Uh, the, uh, several of the Vanderbilts come to Asheville specifically to be treated by Dr. Battle. And of course, uh, I believe it was George Vanderbilt uh, falls in love with the area, and that, of course, leads to the uh, uh, development of Biltmore out there, and Battle will uh, eventually become the uh, private uh, doctor, private physician for uh, the uh, uh, Vanderbilts out there uh, at Biltmore. And uh, Madeline will spend quite a bit of her, uh, her younger years there in Asheville, and then she's sent off to school to St. Mary's here in Raleigh. And uh, she will graduate from there, uh, I believe 1889 or so. Uh, and then she goes off to nursing school in New York. 
Uh, but because she's from such a prominent family and she's rolling in, you know, the, these elite social circles, you know, she's uh, uh, on first name basis with a lot of the Vanderbilts, you know, she's uh, uh, becoming quite popular and she will appear frequently on the, uh, the social pages of newspapers, not just around North Carolina, but uh, really all around the East Coast. And when she goes to New York, uh, she really, she's in her element, shall we say, at that point. Uh, she's able to, to hang out with the, uh, the social elites there in New York. Uh, she's courted by quite a few uh, wealthy uh, suitors up there, including this guy. He was a captain in the British Army at the time, Mortimer Hancock. Uh, very dashing fella, and of course the uh, the British uniform, you know, I'm, I'm sure made him uh, look even more dashing in her eyes at that point. And uh, he becomes the lucky one out of all of her suitors. She uh, accepts an offer of marriage from then Captain Hancock, and he will be a career army officer. We'll talk more about his service here in just a few minutes. Uh, but they will be married in Asheville, and uh, one of the newspapers calls it the most distinguished wedding celebrated in North Carolina for a number of years. And you'll note that's not a New York paper, that's not a North Carolina paper, that's the Atlanta Constitution. So that just goes to show, you know, how well known uh, Madeline Battle and that and her family as well as uh, uh, Captain uh, uh, Hancock was at that time. That it was it was news, you know, people knew who she was all the way down in Georgia. Uh, they would be married at All Souls Cathedral there in uh, Biltmore Village. And then uh, they would honeymoon in one of the, uh, the outbuildings, one of the cottages, if you will, of uh, uh, the Biltmore estate. Oops, don't wanna go there yet. Got ahead of myself. Hancock was assigned at this point to the uh, second battalion of the Royal Fusiliers, which was one of the more elite uh, units of the British army. And it was based in India at the time. So she bounces back and forth. She's over there in India with him for a time. She's here in North Carolina for a while. She's in New York for a while. And uh, when she's in New York, uh, she causes a bit of a ruckus. Uh, Madeline was always fond of animals uh, all the way back to childhood. She always had pets. And the more exotic, the more strange an animal it was, the more she wanted to have it as a pet. Uh, there was uh, I was told uh, by a member of her family, I think it was, uh, it might even been one of her granddaughters, I don't remember now who told me this, uh, but that uh, she had uh, a pet, I think it was an ocelot uh, for a number of years that she kept with her, and it was her constant companion, uh, but then when the ocelot died, uh, suddenly she started uh, wearing a fur made out of uh, ocelot, so uh, you, you can connect the dots, I'm sure, on that one, uh, but when she's in New York, she has another pet, a rat named James. And here is a, a story that was carried in quite a few papers. This particular telling is from the, uh, the Allentown, Pennsylvania newspaper, talking about a ruckus that she called, that she caused in one of the uh, fancier New York establishments. Mrs. Mortimer Hancock, wife of Captain Mortimer Pawson Hancock of the British Army, has been creating commotion in lobbies and dining rooms of big New York hotels for the past few days. Twice she has appeared in different hotels with a sleek, fat, white rat, which answers to the name of James, cavorting about her neck. Hardly had Mrs. Hancock taken her seat in the tea room than the usual quiet of the main hall was broken by the screams of a score of women. Out of the room they tumbled, each clutching her skirts in the old time, mercy, there's a mouse fashion. The officials of the hotel hastened to the scene and they found the tea room deserted, except for Mrs. Hancock reclining in a wicker chair. Then they spotted the cause of the tumult, Right. Around Mrs. Hancock's gleaming white shoulders, the rat James was sporting. Mrs. Hancock had ordered tea and crackers, and every now and then she handed up a morsel to James, who sat up on his haunches and munched it. There was a hurried conference of hotel officials, and it was decided that Mrs. Hancock must be requested to keep her rat out of sight if she were to remain in the hotel. Mrs. Hancock seemed hurt when this news was conveyed to her, and with the greatest reluctance, she secreted James in her bag. And uh, this was not the only time that James would make an appearance, but this was the uh, this was the story that uh, that made James quite a, quite a bit of a uh, uh, fixture on the, on the social pages here of the uh, of many of the leading papers at the time. When she goes to India, of course, she's fascinated by camels. This was her pet charmer, the camel, and Basuli, her dog. Uh, we have quite a few pictures in our collection of her and uh, Charmer, and she noted that uh, this was her favorite of all the animals uh, that she encountered there 
in India. And it's wild, but it's on one of these uh, trips that she's over there in India staying with uh, her husband uh, that she causes another bit of a, a, a problem. And in today's military, this would be a career ender uh, for uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hancock. But back then, it, uh, it was uh, just regarded as a, a bit of a uh, amusing incident. Of course, uh, Hancock and uh, all the other officers of his regiment, uh, they, they like to spend time at the officers club. And uh, Madeline couldn't quite figure out, well, what's so popular about this place? You know, can't you go drink beer somewhere else? And he's like, no, you wouldn't understand. So one day she decides that she's going to follow him there and see what the attraction is. And she goes and peers in the window or she's somehow not seen while she's doing this. And lo and behold, there's a bunch of belly dancers in there, Indian belly dancers. And she's taken aback by this. And so the next day she decides, well, I need, to, I need to see this closer up. So she disguises herself. She joins the dance troupe and goes in there as one of the belly dancers. And at first her husband does not recognize her. And when he eventually does, of course, he's livid and uh, storms up to the stage, throws her over his shoulder and uh, marches out, you know, rambling on about how she has embarrassed him and, you know, how this, uh, you know, how's, he, how's his reputation going to suffer from this? And let's see. <laughs> right, she's not riding side saddle. Yes, uh, I doubt that she ever rode side saddle. Uh, and the uh, she gets uh, such a uh, talking down to from her husband, you know, rightfully so. You know, again, as I said, this would be a career ender in today's uh, military. Uh, but uh, she decides that she's going to take it out on him. So the story goes again. This is another one that we, that we get uh, from her uh, from her family. She was so mad, so distraught, you know, did all kinds of adjectives to describe her feelings at this point. She found every chemical that she could find in the, uh, in the house, poured it on her hair just to see what it would do. I guess she was just, I don't know what she was thinking, honestly, because, you know, who knows what, uh, what kind of concoction she could have uh, come up with there accidentally. But she winds up dyeing her hair orange. It's spiked. And she decides to cut it. So she's got this spiky orange, you know, 1980s skater looking hairdo thing going on. And uh, at that point, the two of them need a break from each other. So she comes back to North Carolina to visit some of her relatives in uh, uh, Rocky Mount as well as Asheville. And they were quite shocked to see her <laughs> arrive with her hair like that. There we go. And World War I breaks out in 1914. Uh, her husband, of course, is a, a British Army officer. It's uh, pretty apparent that he's going to be involved in this at some point, even though he's, he's stationed in India. Uh, the rest of his unit, the other, uh, I believe there was five battalions in the Royal Fusiliers, the other four uh, are almost immediately thrown into, uh, into combat, but his remains in India uh, for some time there until they can get replacement troops to take their spot. Uh, but Glory uh, Madeline, as she's still known at this time, decides that she needs to do something for the war effort. Uh, so she decides she's going to be a nurse. Now, Great Britain declares war uh, against the uh, Central Powers, if I'm not mistaken, on August 6, 1914. By August 13th, so a week later, Hanka Madeline has joined the British Red Cross and she is at a uh, hospital in Belgium. Uh, so within literally days of the declaration of war and hostilities beginning here in Western Europe, uh, she is already uh, close to the front, helping to do her part to take care of wounded soldiers. Initially, uh, as Belgian soldiers, then she will treat uh, soldiers from not only uh, the allied countries, France, Belgium, uh, Great Britain, but uh, she will also eventually have German troops that come under her care. American troops will eventually uh, come into the hospitals where she is stationed. So she takes care of uh, quite a few young men from, uh, from different countries on both sides throughout the four years of conflict. And these are photographs of her at a, uh, a hospital there in Belgium. Unfortunately, they're not, uh, they're not dated, but we do know obviously that they're from sometime in World War I. We can see the horrific injuries in this fellow over here at the left. And this was actually a very uh, popular image that uh, circulated quite a bit through uh, uh, during uh, World War I. And uh, when we had our World War I exhibit at the museum a few years ago, uh, this photograph was featured, but at the time we did not know that was Madeline Hancock until her family donated her medals and her scrapbook uh, in, I guess it was the end of 2018 
And lo and behold, this photograph was in the scrapbook and it's very easily identifiable as her based on the rest of the, the photographs in there. So uh, we were able to identify that one. Now, here's a few quotes from some of her writings. Uh, she would stay in uh, pretty much constant uh, touch with both her father as well as other family members back in North Carolina telling them about what's going on over there. Most of the letters are from the, the latter half of the war. Uh, so I've got a few selections here of her writing that I want to read to you. I am on night duty again and alone, and we get 39 and 40 wounded in a night, all to be washed and their dressings done besides treatment for most of them. And by morning, I am like a resurrected corpse. I really never was so tired in my life. We all are. Four years of this has about finished me in every way. I think everybody feels the same, worn out mentally and physically. We have lots of German wounded, such nice mannered boys, most of them. I was so surprised and our wounded are good to them, waiting on them and talking to them. Poor devils, they don't want to fight any more than our soldiers do. So this letter to me was, was very fascinating because it, it's eye-opening for her, you know, to, to get her thoughts on the German wounded, you know. And this was true of probably just about everybody, soldier, nurses, non-combatants, anybody. You know, when you're at war, you, you try to dehumanize the enemy. So that way you can it help to mentally process and justify uh, the horrors of the battlefield. But then when you're in situations like this, where you have wounded enemy soldiers there and you get to talking to them, you find out their motivation in a lot of ways is the same as the, the soldiers on, on our side. You know, they're fighting for their country. They're fighting because it was their patriotic duty. They're fighting because their government asked them to. And like she says, they didn't want to be there any more than the, than the American and British soldiers did. The main things they wanted to go home. They want the war to be over. They want to go home safely to their families, you know? So it's, it's not like, you know, the, the uh, recruiting poster shows, you know, the, these animal-like uh, Germans, the Huns, as they were called, you know, that was about as far from the truth as possible for most of them during World War I. You know, they were there because uh, they were fighting for their country, the same as the British, the French, the Germans, or excuse me, the, the French and the, the American soldiers. And I think this letter is, is when that uh, fact really sunk home in her mind. And while she's over there, she's there for all four years. She only gets, I think, two uh, lengthy breaks away from the hospital at both times she goes to Paris. Uh, just to get away. She couldn't take the uh, what she was seeing there in the hospitals anymore. She was on the verge of a, a mental breakdown quite often. And in some of these quotes, you'll see that. And this is one of those letters uh, where that's apparent. I was never so homesick in my life. I've got to get back to you now and never leave. Honest to God, I'm so sick of having people depend on me that I could scream. At the last bombardment, I would have given everything I possessed to hang on to somebody and be as big a baby as I wanted to instead of having to play the hero of, of the Johnstown flood and keep other men from being scared, the poor devils. And this is another thing that's, uh, that's uh, prevalent throughout her writing. When she has these wounded young men uh, under her care, regardless of which side they're from, they're looking to her almost as a mother, as a sister, you know, she is their uh, caretaker, you know, they're looking to her for their strength. And she realizes that if she breaks down and has, uh, you know, if she goes into a crying fit or, you know, goes over and uh, shelters under the table, you know, what kind of example is that going to be setting for them? So uh, you can see also throughout her writings, you know, this, this struggle, this internal struggle that she's having uh, to, to re retain her composure, uh, to help booster the morale of the men that are under her care. And quite often, she was the senior nurse. She was in, in charge of a lot of these uh, uh, recovery uh, stations. This is a a great seldom seen photo of her right here alongside a Red Cross ambulance in Belgium. And uh, at this one, again, you can tell she's uh, getting near the breaking point. Truly, if the war doesn't end soon, I'll have to chuck it. Isn't it awful of me? I've got a ward of bad cases and I'm going hard all night. And it interests me, of course, and I'm more than sorry for them. I just can't stand the suffering all around me as I have all these years. And I think it was right after uh, this letter was written uh, that she did go on one of her uh, uh, mental health escapes to uh, to Paris uh, for a couple of weeks. And it's interesting to note 
that uh, her husband, uh, by this point, he's a lieutenant colonel, he's in command of the 2nd Battalion. Uh, once they get into combat, he will see heavy action at Gallipoli. I believe that's where he's wounded. And uh, when he is wounded in action, he goes, I believe, back to London. She doesn't go to take care of him. She stays in Belgium taking care of the other men. Uh, that just shows her dedication and uh, you know how, uh, how much what she was doing there at the front, how important that was to her, that she was willing to let someone else nurse her own husband while she took care of men that she did not know and would probably never see ever again. And uh, he would eventually uh, recover from his wounds and get back into action uh, in France. But as far as I could tell, uh, she was not involved with his recovery. Move this out of the way. Ambulances for miles, almost touching each other, a continual stream. Hundreds come in and are operated on and are sent on every hour. I've never seen such wounds and so many deaths dying on the stretchers before they can be attended to. The mud is so impossible. Some of the wounded lay out there four or five days before an ambulance could get to them. Sometimes the men get stuck waist deep in the mud. It is impossible to get them out. And she's not based at the same hospital uh, throughout the war. She will move from hospital to hospital. Some are well behind the lines in what's left of some of the uh, uh, major cities and towns there on the Western front. Other times she's closer to the front, not in the immediate uh, uh, aid stations that are right behind the lines, but in some of the intermediate ones. So that's what she's talking about when she says that they come in and are operated on and are sent on. She, at this point, she's at one of the intermediate stations where they come in and try to stabilize the patient before he's sent back uh, to one of the larger places in the rear. And it's when she's at these intermediate ones and sometimes even closer than that, that she comes under fire. She's gassed uh, several times during the war from a German gas attack. She comes under artillery bombardments quite often. Uh, so she's, uh, she's not immune to the, uh, the uh, dangers of the battlefield here, even though as a non-combatant behind the lines, she's still being subjected quite frequently to artillery fire and uh, poison gas attacks. And again, that, that's part of the reason uh, why she's having these uh, 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 mental uh, breakdowns going on. And then this is one of the uh, more amusing uh, things that she wrote to me. I'm dying for American cooking again. We can't get fresh fruit in the canteens up here now. And I dream of waffles and fried chicken and sundaes. So I, I think that one right there is something we could all relate to, uh, uh, looking for some, uh, some good home cooking there. Uh, and this, this one, I believe, was uh, written to her uh, uh, stepmother back in uh, uh, Asheville. When the war is over, she becomes the most, oh, before I get to that, I guess I should tell you why, why she's called Glory. Uh, very early in the war, her patients were uh, struck by her cheery demeanor. So throughout all of this, and we've seen uh, through these samplings of her letters, you know, what's going on inside her head, but externally to her patients, she remains just constantly cheery and very upbeat. They have no idea what's going on in her mind. And that was probably her greatest contribution was that she was able to keep that focus and keep these men from focusing on their wounds and from focusing on the horrors of war. She was able to keep them upbeat, uh, hopefully thinking about, uh, about home and their recovery and eventually getting back to see their own families. And several uh, uh, soldiers uh, started to call her morning glory because of that, uh, because of her demeanor. And she loved that name, uh, loved it so much that uh, she starts calling herself and going by the name Glory. Uh, she really drops the name Madeline for a time during the war and calls herself Glory Hancock. And uh, after the war, uh, she has a bit of a, I guess we'd call it a fan club today. They're known as the, uh, the Glory Hancock or the uh, Glory Relief Association, I think is what they call themselves, uh, to help take care of uh, veterans who had lasting wounds from the war, you know, whether they lost a limb or had lingering uh, effects from gas attacks or what have you. Uh, that was one of the uh, uh, various relief associations that sprang up. And uh, she was extremely honored uh, to know that they, uh, they adopted her name by that. Um, but when the war is over, she becomes the most decorated woman of the war. She receives decorations from three different countries, uh, Great Britain, France, and Belgium, including the Croix de Guerre from both France and Belgium. So we're not talking, you know, low-ranking civilian uh, decorations. She's getting some major uh, decorations of valor and uh, recognitions 
uh, of her contributions to the war effort here. Uh, you can see she had them all mounted in this uh, uh, nice shadow box, which remained in the family up until about uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, her granddaughters came over uh, from Scotland uh, over here to, to Raleigh. Uh, they had a bit of a small family reunion, the, uh, the overseas uh, family, as well as the, the Rocky Mountain area family and some others all had a, a mini family reunion at the Museum of History. Uh, they shared stories uh, about uh, Madeline Hancock and they presented her scrapbook and her shadow box of her decorations to the museum. So we now have this in our collection. And uh, you can see, whoops, you can see this shadow box in our new exhibit, Answering the Call. Uh, Gloria Hancock is one of the individuals that is featured there. And uh, as I mentioned, she becomes quite a, uh, uh, not quite a rock star, but you know, she's quite the celebrity uh, in Asheville as well as Rocky Mount because of her North Carolina ties. Uh, there were articles that were written about her uh, in, uh, in both ends of the state in newspapers. Uh, of course, the, uh, I mentioned the uh, Glory Relief Association, but the Tarboro paper does a, an article about her in 1920. And uh, it noted that until the last of the war, Mrs. Hancock was at dressing stations close behind the Allied lines of battle until the last moment of the war, never being beyond the sound of the guns and frequently within the zone of fire. She was gassed and was repeatedly in the midst, midst of shrapnel fire, but always escaped without serious injury. And that's not exaggeration. They are being 100 percent uh, truthful right there. There is no journalistic embellishment going on in that article. And unfortunately, even though she becomes uh, quite, uh, quite the celebrity, the war had taken a, a toll on her marriage uh, between what she had seen and experienced in the hospitals and what her husband had experienced on the battlefield. They just, marriage was, was no longer going to work for them. Uh, they separated soon after the war and uh, he would continue on with his uh, military career there. They had a son uh, named Westray West Ray Battle Hancock, he would uh, join the British Army. He would actually serve in his, uh, in his father's regiment, the uh, uh, Royal Fusiliers, uh, during World War II. But uh, Glory does not survive that long after the war. She dies relatively young in, uh, in 1930. I believe she was about 50 years of age when she died. Uh, she died in Nice, France, uh, but she may have known uh, that the end was approaching because she came back to uh, North Carolina a couple of weeks before she died. Uh, to meet with her uh, family in both Asheville as well as uh, Rocky Mount Tarboro area. And uh, she spent several weeks uh, perhaps saying her final goodbyes to her American family. Um, and then she went back to France. She underwent surgery there and uh, died from complications of the surgery. But uh, during her final years there, and there's not a lot known about her life after the war, uh, but what is known is that during her time in France, uh, she helped to take care for war wounded over there, uh, taking care of uh, French and Belgian wounded who, who suffered uh, lasting effects from the war. And I was asked in an earlier presentation, and I don't remember uh, what it was, it may have been one of the uh, presentations about our answering the call exhibit, but somebody asked about her medals. Did she get anything from the United States? And she did not, strangely enough, even though uh, she still considered herself an American, she did not receive anything from the United States government or from the state of North Carolina. Of course, uh, that's, that can be explained by the fact, well, she wasn't serving in an American unit. She was serving in the British Red Cross. So it's not like uh, she was uh, uh, directly serving in the American cause, but as a North Carolinian, as an American and quite possibly the first North Carolinian to serve, uh, to volunteer for the war effort, one would think that at least the state of North Carolina would have done something to recognize her service. And she does touch on that in one of her letters. I found this when I was uh, getting this presentation ready uh, the past couple of days. In one of her letters, she does specifically uh, mention, uh, she's writing to one of her relatives here in North Carolina, I don't remember who it is, uh, but she uh, raises the possibility of the governor of North Carolina perhaps giving her one of the North Carolina service medals because the, the states as well as several towns around uh, North Carolina prepared medals that they presented to all World War I service members. Uh, but she did not get one. And that's the only time that I'm familiar with that she mentioned any of her medals. She did not go out in search of any of these things, but she was specifically interested in getting some kind of recognition from 
North Carolina. And unfortunately, that never happened. Uh, and hopefully, we're able to correct that. The uh, uh, Department of Military and Veterans Affairs here in North Carolina is trying to get her uh, some long overdue recognition. So we'll, we'll see what becomes of that. Uh, but there is uh, the colorful life of Madeline Glory Hancock. And I hope that uh, uh, you've uh, learned something new today about a relatively unknown figure in North Carolina's history. And it, it's interesting to me that it says uh, that, that she is so little known because in all of her obituaries that appeared throughout North Carolina when she died in 1930, just about all of them mention this book right here. Whoop, uh -oh. Not what I meant to do. Fighting in Flanders. It mentions her book. Some of them refer to it as her well-known book. Well, it's so well-known that I can't find anything about it. Google doesn't know anything about it. Nobody else seems to know anything about it. So I don't know what this well-known book of hers is. I would love to find out. And if, it, if it's still around, get a copy of it and read it, because I'm sure it's fascinating reading. Okay, looks like we got a few questions here. Uh, did she remarry? Did she? Uh, uh, looks like this one is in reference to her name, uh, De Helen Court. Uh, very good question. One of the decorations that she received, I believe it was from Belgium, it carried along with it the title of Countess De Helen Court. Uh, so she did not remarry, but uh, one of her decorations made her uh, lower ranking uh, Belgian royalty. Uh, known as the Countess de Helen Court. So that is what that is in reference to. She stopped using the name Hancock uh, after, the, uh, after the two of them uh, divorced and she went by Madeline de Helen Court, taking advantage of that, uh, uh, that Belgian title there. So that is what that one is in regards to. How many descendants does she have? Uh, to my knowledge, they only had the one son. Uh, he married uh, and had uh, several children. Um, there's quite a few. I don't know how many direct descendants there are of her, but there's quite a few uh, battles that are that are related to her, as well as, of course, the, the Hancock line on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, her, her grandchildren that, uh, that brought her medals to us uh, live in Scotland. I believe there's uh, some others in England. There might be some in, in France as well. I don't know, but there, there's quite a few uh, battle cousins, I guess they would be in, uh, in North Carolina in both sides of the state. Do you think part of the conflict with her husband was that what she had seen made her a pacifist or he was still in the military or pro-military? Um, I don't think she became a pacifist, uh, so to speak. Again, there, there's not much known about her after the war. I don't think uh, that she became uh, a pacifist, and I don't think she was one beforehand. Uh, if she had been, I, I don't think she would have uh, married uh, a military officer, but um, that, that's a question I, I really don't have a good answer to. I don't think she was a pacifist, uh, especially since uh, uh, their son went into the military. I think if, if she had been dead set against that, I imagine she could have uh, steered him uh, in another direction. Where did she get her training as a nurse? I uh, forget the name of the school. It was a nursing school in New York City. Uh, I want to say Presbyterian Nursing School, but I won't swear to that. Yeah, there we go, Presbyterian Nursing. All right, well, if there are no other questions, I thank you all for attending and hope you have a wonderful day. And I would invite you to Come on down to the museum when you get a chance to see our Answering the Call exhibit, to, to see Glory Hancock's medals, and to learn about uh, some other uh, figures, some other lesser known and possibly overlooked figures in uh, North Carolina history. All right. Thank you very much.